We have been in a series going through the letter or the book of Ephesians, and we titled our, mess, our sermon series, People of the Promise. The letter to the Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison for proclaiming, preaching the good news, the gospel, the mystery of the gospel revealed. And specifically, he was in prison, and we'll actually see that a little bit um, mentioned today in the text that we're going through. But he is in prison for preaching this good news. And let's look at a little bit what this good news is. So it's Ephesians 3, 6 is our theme verse for this series. It says, This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise, or, yeah, in the promise in Christ Jesus. So, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, rose again, defeating death, ascended on high. And that was done all within a small region in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, and the Jews had been waiting for a Messiah. But God's plan was much bigger than that. It wasn't just for the Jews and to the Jews, but it was to the world and for the world, which is a big praise God for us because that's the whole reason that at 4 o'clock on a Sunday in Lacey, Washington, on the other side of the planet, we're all here gathered in the God-man Jesus Christ's name. So we're grateful that this mission and this purpose that not only the Apostle Paul was set on, but that God had set all believers, all people who have called on his name on his mission— It's the whole reason that we can even be here today and know about our great Savior and what he's done on our behalf. So uh, before we jump into today's text, let's pray and ask God to start to work in our hearts. Father God, we lift up this time before you. We lift up your word as we read it. We just ask that it would ignite in our hearts your truth, your message, your word, Lord God, that we would hear your voice and respond. Lord God, that all the things that we work through today that are challenging, all the things that we work through today, Lord God, that ring true in our heart, help them not be burdensome, Lord God, but let us hear joyfully the call and the importance that you place on these words, Lord God, in our life. Help us understand them, receive them with joy, and help there actually be change within us today, Lord God, that we'd walk out these doors not looking the same, but glorifying your name together with one another, unified as your people. So we give you this time. We give you all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Okay, so quick recap. The last few weeks, kind of a couple months, we've been going through the letter letter to the Ephesians. The Apostle Paul is writing to them. And the last uh, several weeks that we've been going over the first three chapters of Ephesians has been theology saturated. Who is God? What has he done? How has he reconciled us? What does that mean? Uh, What mission did the Apostle Paul specifically have a role in that? And how was he accomplishing that? What was his status? What was going on? What was his message? And so it was very heady in the sense of like stuff to know. What has God done? How did he accomplish our salvation? That there is a salvation. That he's reconciling Jew and Gentile not only to himself, but to each other. He's taking these two people groups that the world would have looked at and going like, there's no way they could ever get along. There's no way that they could ever be unified. And God did it, which would have been a big deal. But those first three chapters have just been very much of like, this is what God has done, which we all can applaud, and it's good to know, and there's a reason that it's good to know. And that's because what we're about to see is Paul transition the entire letter from moving from what we believe, what we know, and what the truth is, to how does that impact our life? What is, what, okay, so, so what? So now what? What does that mean? It's not just words. It's like, okay. God reconciled us. Cool. But Paul doesn't leave it there. Um, He starts to transition the letter to say, this is now how you are to live. Not to get salvation, because he already made it very clear in the first three chapters that you aren't working to get your salvation. It's a gift from God. And so 
Now he's saying, now that you guys have been reconciled not only to God, but to one another, that should mean something. That should look different. So that brings us to our text today. It's 16 verses. Thank you, worship team, for cutting a song and giving me more time. That's not the reason, but I'm, I think the Lord, I think that was the Lord's plan. So I'll take it. Uh, let's go ahead and start. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I'm going to read it out of my Bible. If you have your Bible, you should too, or it will be up here on the screen. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So... Christ, gave him, or Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine and by cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I just burned up my four minutes that I was given. (laughs) All right. So it's a lot to work through. So we're going to just chunk through it. There's going to be three main sections that we're really going to be looking at um, and kind of lumping them together. So just to kind of make it easy, we'll go section by section. Um, But before we get into the sections, the very first verse I want us to look at says, As a prisoner... For the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. This is the Apostle Paul writing from prison, as a prisoner, but not of Rome, but of the Lord. He has, he is in chains by the Roman government, but he views himself as a prisoner of the Lord, that he himself would take this good news And that he himself would look to God and the Lord as his master, as his father, and say, I serve him and I do what he wills. Not only is that true, but he is a real prisoner because of the gospel message that he is preaching and taking out into the world. Which is really great because not only um, with this as a prisoner for the Lord, it says then... And if, depending on what translation you read, like if you read the ESV, it actually starts with, therefore. And once that therefore happens in the letter of the Ephesians, nothing in Ephesians is the same. We're now talking about how do we live in light of God's truth, which is still fantastic because it's all saying the same thing. He's saying, as a prisoner for the Lord, then after all of these things, I urge you, which is plead with you, beg you, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You ask, what is that calling? What are those things? That's what we've been covering the last several weeks. The calling that God called on our life, put on our life, placed on our life. The hope in which he's given us. He's called us to this hope, and we'll see that in a little bit. But he is saying, I urge you to live a life worthy. And the best part about this is he is saying it while he's in chains. So he is saying, he's not telling, he's not asking them to do anything that he himself is not already willing to have done, right? So he himself is in prison for preaching that gospel news and he, and living a worthy life, a life worthy. And he's saying, do the same. It doesn't mean that they'd end up in prison, but he's saying, no matter the cost, live a life worthy. And he can say that. 
He can call on them and say, follow my example. So, and also this idea of what, like, what is a life worthy? Well, this life worthy actually has more of the idea of equal weights. So this, in this equal weight or this equal in weightiness is, it's like equal in accordance to your beliefs. So you should live a life that is equal to what you believe. They should be together. There should be unity between your belief and your actions and what you believe driving your actions. And so if we go over the first three chapters of Ephesians, it's loaded with what God has done, what he has called us to, what he has prepared us for, what he's doing in us currently, and all of those things. And then for us to potentially be over here and be like, yeah, those things are really cool. Those would be unequal measures. Those things would not be equal. But he's calling them to say, in light of what you believe, live like it. You believe things, so live like it. Which is why the title of today's message is called A Life Worthy of Our Life. I actually wanted to change it, but I forgot to ask my wife to do it. Thank you. Uh, which all I was going to do is add a Y right here. Lit, a life worthy of your life, of my life. I just wanted to make it more pointed, you know. But it is our life in the sense of collected and co- the collective. And that's actually what we're going to be seeing today because Paul, even though he says that we are to live a, a life worthy, he's not saying it just individually, but we're going to see very quickly that it's all together, that it's among the believers and for the believers. So with that, we're going to go ahead and start chunking away at the big three sections of what does it look like to live a worthy life? Not just individually, although it will affect us individually, but what does it look like as a group of believers that he's saved and reconciled? And here's the deal. For us, our biggest problems might not be the Jew and Gentile reconciliation. And Jewish people are just the people who had historically had God's scripture and laws and words and presence, but also the Gentiles were just the rest of the world. Everyone else who had historically been excluded from all of those things. And there was hostility between the two different people groups, but he's brought them together. And so now he's going to start to say, now this is what it looks like to live with one another. This is where you're, you're called to a life worthy of what you believe. And so here is what that actually looks like. And so before, uh, in the next several weeks, we're going to be going over ex- like pretty nitty gritty from like, what does it look like in the church? What does it look like in our home? What does it look like individually? And so it's going to be really there, like really uh, point by point of the household. How does it look like? What's it look like? How's it set up? But today, there's some foundations of understanding the purpose of these things and what we're called to initially that will help us focus our future of what and, and focus and have a good uh, grounding before we start just being told, do these things. So if we don't understand where they're coming out of or what we're actually aiming for, it won't matter because then we're just doing stuff and we're not call, called to just do stuff. So let's look at um, the first section, which I titled, Called to Unity. Paul begins to lay it out in the next verse that we're called to unity. Ephesians 4.2 says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. We could stop here forever, basically forever. Like we wouldn't, we could come back next Sunday and just preach this one again and be set for the rest of our life, trying to work this out because it starts off, he's like, hey, you're going to live a life worthy of the calling to which you received. And the first thing on the first item, line item, is be completely humble. That's kind of, to me, that struck me as kind of funny and also just like the seriousness that he actually has in our calling and what we're called to, to be completely humble. What's crazy about this word humble too is in the Greek word that's actually used there, um, they believe that Paul made it up made up the word humble in the, word, in the language, the Greek language. And the reason is, is because the Greeks and the Romans didn't have a word for humility. They didn't have a word for being humble. Because to them, that was, that was a disgrace. Who would want to be humble? The reason that they think that Paul made it up is because 
It, before the New Testament, in all Greek literature, they don't see the word show up. It's only after the New Testament shows up that they start seeing it in gr uh, Greek literature. And the only, and the main uh, usage of it is, a, is as a derogatory term towards Christians. Look at them humble Christians. Look at them being filled with humility. That's humiliating, you know. They, they didn't have respect for that. Humility was a bad word to them kind of just makes us realize we live in different times, right? So he starts it off with being humble. But we should actually talk about what is being humble. C.S. Lewis has a quote. I think he, it's, he just kind of hits the nail on the head, and then we'll move on to the next one. So he says, humility is, or isn't thinking less of yourself, but it is thinking of yourself less right? So you're not, you're not looking down on yourself. You're not, you don't hate yourself. That's not what humility is. It's not not liking yourself. It's just, you're not the priority. You're not the center of your world, right? We start to care, which is a great first line item to have if you're going to start talking about how to live together, is stop thinking of yourself first and start thinking about those around you. It's a great way to start that off. So that's humble. Gentle is, it's just being gentle. Another way that it can be put is meekness. And meekness is not weakness. It is actually more of like, it's a mild temperament or being able to be self-controlled in the situations. Patience is this idea of not just waiting, but of long-suffering. And unfortunately, long-suffering or forbearance in this meaning here, I actually think is a lost virtue that we have today. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I, a thing I hear people often say is, oh, I don't need that negativity in my life. Oh, I don't need that negativity in my life. That person's just a, they just, they suck the life out of me. It's draining. Oh, they're just the worst, you know. But if God had said the same thing about us, we'd be in a, we'd have some problems, but God didn't. He had patience with us. And we are kind of intolerable and sinful, but he showed us grace. And so, once again, and, those are, and that was all laid out in the first three chapters of Ephesians. We just have to go back and read it. It's all there. That in our wickedness and in our rebellion, he loved us and he saved us and he reached out and grabbed our hearts. And he didn't have to, but he was patient with us. So we can be patient. Bearing with one another in love, it says. And once again, we talked about it last week. This word love here is uh, the Greek word agape, which is an intentional love. It's a purposed, willful love. It's not like, I don't, I don't feel like loving you today, so I'm sorry, I can't. It's, I'm choosing to love you today, regardless of you being unbearable. I'm choosing to love you today even if you, I already love you, you know, that's, just, that's great. But regardless, I have decided to love you. I have decided I'm being intentional to love you. And so it's a purposed love, and it should be from a people purposed to love. So an unconditional love isn't uh, a love that seeks a response in the same manner. It's like, I'm only giving you this type of love if you give me this type of love. It's like, no, 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 no. Regardless of you, what you do, I'm going to love you. I'm choosing to love you. And forbearance, like we talked about this patience, forbearance without love will quickly lead to anger and resentment. So all these things need to go together. This patience, this humility, this thinking, thinking of others more highly than yourself. And I, uh, I was a while back, I don't remember who, what, book I was reading, but I heard um, a pastor say to other pastors, and the quote was, you only love your church as much as you love the most difficult person in your church, which is challenging. The most difficult person in my church? The most difficult person in our church? And this isn't just for pastors. I think this is for all of us as members of a body, of a community, that we should be able to look and go like, oh, I love my church. Well, who are they? All the people that love me. All the people that I get along with, all the people that are easy, to, that we like the same things. Well, what about the one that you, you avoid? 
What about that person? Do you really love your church? That's what he starts off with. Those are the first four things that he starts off with in verse 2 of 16. <laughs> he gives us these four characteristics which all take intentionality. It takes intentionality to be, hum- to be humble and have humility, to be gentle, patient, and bearing with one another in love, which is why he follows it with the next verse. 4.3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. How many efforts? Every single one. To keep the unity of peace. The unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. To make every effort. It's intentional. And the thing that's really interesting here is he doesn't say, so that you can make peace, so that you can create peace, because we don't do that. We don't make peace. We didn't create peace. That was done through the bond of peace. And who's our bond? Who's our common bond? It's Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's who is our, our bond. That's who brings us together when there was no way to be brought together. So making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. So what he's saying is, it's not something that you create, but it is something you fight for, and it is something that you keep. It is something that you have to be intentional if you want it to stay there. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's pretty, it takes a lot of dying to self in order to make this possible. It takes a lot of dying to self, and I think that's a big example of what those first four things had shown us. He goes on to drive this point of unity and this common bond and reminding us, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, there is one body, one spirit, and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. There's one. Paul shows us that we have been united in a faith that is united. We're united in a faith that is unified. So, if we're united in a faith that is unified, how then could we live like we're not unified? How could we then live and not be or have unity? We have to dig in and be intentional to keep this. Because if we remember what we believe, who we've been saved by, what we've been called to, well, then all of a sudden, all those other things should be able to fade away. With my intention to go like, oh, well... It's not all about me. It's not about my life. It's all about Jesus. I'm called the one Lord and one God. We all have this one faith, this one baptism. We have the same hope. So how could I continue to not extend what all of this means, chapter 1 through 3 of Ephesians, what all of these things are, how could I then turn around and not have unity or seek unity with my brothers and sisters. And this was the plan of God, as we've been talking about. It's the context, like we had said. Ephesians is to the church in Ephesus, made up of Jewish people and Gentiles. God was reconciling them. And in Romans 3, 29 through 30, kind of sums all of this up a little bit. Or is, it, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by one faith, and the circumcised are the Jewish people, and the uncircumcised, which is the Gentile world, through that same faith. Same faith, same plan, one God, one faith, one way, one people brought together. He's talking about how we are to live. And so kind of a big point to summarize a lot of what's being talked about here is, I wrote down this point, the fruit of your life will reveal what you really believe. The fruit of your life will reveal what you really believe. The first three chapters of Ephesians, and the reason I keep saying the first three chapters, the first three chapters, and I'm not just going through all the first three chapters, is because, first of all, it's three chapters long. I'm not going to go through all of it, but If you want to know the foundation and the grounding and the reason for all of these things and how they're even made possible, you have to know the why, which we're done 
in the first three chapters. Unity comes from what we believe. The fruit of our life will reveal what we really believe. If we believe that there's a God who's reconciled us when we didn't deserve it, who saved us and called us and is sanctifying us and is uniting us to himself, then how could I not extend that same type of grace to a brother or sister who has offended me? Not just some person who's neutral, but someone who's like offended me where I would call my enemy in life. No, I, I should be able to feel more enabled to go out of my way to extend grace because God extended grace to me and I didn't deserve it. And so we, what we believe is important because it will produce fruit in our life. And what we believe is important. I was actually thinking about this a little bit today when I was going through my notes. I'm kind of like going through couples counseling or going, I don't know if you're in a disagreement with just a person, you guys decide to go to like a, like a therapist or go to therapy or something like that. What you believe matters. Because if you, as both parties, go into that room and one thinks that things can get better and one doesn't, you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems forever until what you believe changes, right? It's important because at the point where you both believe that things can get better, things can actually start to get better. So what you believe is important. And you can try to pretend that you love your church. You can try to pretend that you love your neighbor, but at the end of the day, you can only fool yourself and others for a time, and you can't fool God. And your fruit will come to fruition. So if we really believe in the love and the grace given to us and provided by Christ and our Father, then we can be humbled to extend that grace. We can be ready and patient to share that love and give that love to others. Philippians 1, 27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is just another place where Paul has kind of reiterated the same idea. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Sorry, I'm just now realizing, I'm like, this, is, this actually kind of just sums up everything perfectly. Like, he, he wants them to stand firm in the one spirit, striving together, right? Trying to keep it fighting for it, being intentional for it, as one for the faith of the gospel. Unity without a unifier is shallow and unstable. But Jesus is our unifier. We actually have something that unifies us and calls us and brings us together. So we need a unifier, and we have a unifier. And that's all where? Chapters 1 through 3, right? So we're called to unity because without fighting to maintain this unity, we won't have it. So we're called to unity. We're not just called like, hey, called you, here you are, now you have unity. It's like, no, you're this is a daily, constant, purposed thing to have unity. And it's very, very important as a foundation to be intentional. So in, the best part is, is that none of this unity is in our own strengths. He's blessed our, the church with giftings and people. And that's actually where we're going to go next. Let's look at the next section of verses, which I called gifted and equipped. <laughs> Made it work. It. Gifted and equipped. <clears throat> Let's continue in verse seven. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Yep, that's the two verses. Uh, here he's quoting Psalm 68. If you go read that quote, you'll see that it actually isn't a word-for-word -word quotation. And the reason that they believe that that is is either uh, Paul is paraphrasing that entire chapter or summarizing that entire chapter as a whole. But his point is, is that Christ has given gifts to the church. It goes on, Ephesians 4 and 9. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is 
the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Point that Paul's making here, God's above it all. He gets to do what he wants. If he wants to give church, or if he wants to give gifts to the church and to whom he wants, however he wants, he gets to do it. He fills the whole universe. He's higher than all the heavens. He has the authority. So, and this gifting is not just for some members of the body, but every member of the body is gifted for something. And he's about to hone in on some specific, uh, specific ones for a specific reason, but I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that all of us have been given gifts. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, in, let's uh, move on. Ephesians 4.11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. We have apostles and prophets writing their writings, and they're the ones who delivered God's word to us. We have evangelists who take God's word and go out to the world and deliver it to everyone. And we have pastors, or another word, uh, depending on the type of uh, translation you have, is shepherds, right? So we have shepherds or pastors and teachers, and their job is to help us understand God's word to understand it. And what is the purpose of these people? Ephesians 4.12. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Equip his people. Or in your Bible, it might say equip the saints. And who are the saints? We're the saints. All of us. Saints are nobody, well, nobody special. We are special (laughs) because God loved us and God saved us. But there aren't Christians who start out at level one and then you get to level 10 and become a saint Christian. No. If you are a believer who's put your faith in Jesus, you've been saved and you are a saint. The reason why it's important to make that distinction is because we do that a lot in our own Christian walk. We go, I'm the guy who sits in the pew and listens to a guy talk. And then there's other people out there who do crazy things in history. We, that preach, that perform miracles or do whatever. And we will count ourselves out. We go like, oh, because they're like, they're the super Christian. They're the person who God's really, really, like really loves and given like really, like the big gifts, you know. We separate that. God has not separated that. There are specific jobs for specific roles and specific things that we're supposed to do. And the reason that he's given those specific people beforehand is to equip the saints, all of God's people, to do God's work. Not, they're not the only ones doing God's work. But their job is actually to help other people do the work that God has prepared, right? This is the proper way in which to use our gifts. But we need direction and equipping in order to use them in the manner God intended. So God is teaching us. He's giving us people to give us direction. And where do we go to find how to use these gifts and to be equipped? Well, if we look at... Well, actually, there's a point. We'll do the point first. As believers, our primary tool for being equipped is God's word. Beforehand, I said the big, some of the biggest roles that the apostles and the prophets had were what? Delivering God's word. The evangelists did what? They take God's word and they take it out to the world. And you have the teachers and the shepherds or pastors. And what's their job? To explain and teach God's word. All for what? To equip God's people. And in Timothy, 2 Timothy... 3, 16 through 17, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you want to be equipped, you have to get in God's word. You have to know God's word, and you have to believe God's word. 
can't just know it. You have to believe it. Like we talked about before, what is actually believing it? It should change something. It should do something in you. It should produce fruit in your life. And he cooked for what? The works of service or the works of the ministry. But I thought that that's what pastors were for. I thought they were the ones supposed to do that. Yes and no. Yes, pastors are called to do the same thing that all believers are called to do. But their primary function is in equipping the church, specifically all believers, for those works. Why do we have to be equipped in God's word to do the works of the ministry? Because God's word and truth give us our direction, and most importantly, it gives us the why behind what we do. So remember I said earlier, we're not just trying to do stuff. Stuff doesn't mean anything, has no purpose. But God hasn't called us to stuff. Without the why, we're just doing tasks. And we'll be burned out. It won't be very long before we go like, I show up and I do things. No one sees me. No one likes me. No one, like, I, I'm making all of these assumptions, but I'm just here to do the thing and get out. And that's church for me. That's not what he's called us to. So part of the question I would have for you, for myself, is why do you come to church? Why do you come to church? Do you come to be equipped in hearing God's word? Do you come to be equipped by hearing God's word? Or do you come just to listen to a guy talk? Because the second one will have no value to you in the long run. The purpose for the works of the ministry and being equipped is that Christ's body would be built up, God's people doing his work, so that together as a body, we would be built up. I heard it said, it was in my reading, that like the modern church can kind of be like equated to, um, they said soccer, but I think the guy was British, so I'm going to say football, um, which to them kind of means the same thing. So, um, with what the modern church is like and can normally be summed up to is you have 22,000 fans in the seats in need of exercise, and you have 22 people on the field who need rest, right? But that's not the way that God set up his church. That's how a church ends up being. There's a few people who, can, who, are, who are supposed to do it all, the only ones that can do it all, and everyone else watch. That's not what Christ said. That's not what God has said and revealed in his word. But it's more like the congregation, the believers, the body are the ones on the field. The pastors and the teachers are the ones, not on the sidelines in the sense of not doing anything, but on the sidelines of coaching saying, here's what you're supposed to do. And the people that should be up there spectating is the rest of the world. It's our family. It's our coworkers. It's everyone else in the world should be watching the believers and how we interact with one another and what God is doing among us. That is our role. And we shouldn't be surprised that God has told us to get in the game, right? Like we shouldn't be surprised that he's told us that he has set us on mission with himself. Earlier in Ephesians, we're going to go check out one of those places in those first three chapters. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it's his plan. It's not a surprise. And this isn't a working for our salvation, but this is a working from our salvation. We've been saved And now God said, here's a new direction for your life. And here's the things I prepared for you. Now walk in them. When we we follow Jesus, our life will start to look different. And we'll realize that our life is not our own. It's been bought by Christ, by his blood, giving himself to reconcile us to himself, which makes it a lot easier to not have me at the center of my life. Makes it a lot easier for me to die to myself.
We, as a church, should be doing this together. Um, and if you like to read theology books, uh, sometimes there's a distinction made between the church. There's the invisible church, and that's like those who are in the church that God really knows are real believers. And we have the visible church, because none of us can really know who is or isn't saved, because that's a, that's a God job, right? We, we have our own relationship with God, and we strive together as brothers and sisters, encouraging one another. Um, but I was reading a pastor, and he said, uh, basically to kind of sum up, he's like, basically, just because God has an invisible church doesn't mean that we're supposed to be invisible in his church. And what he's saying is, if we show up, or maybe don't show up, we say, hey, I belong to this body. And everyone else is like, who are you? And not in a rude way, but like, we, we do life together. We work together. We strive together. But at every opportunity, you're not there. At every opportunity, you're not a part. And this isn't to like blast the people who are not a part. It's to say you're missing out because we're building something together, which God has prepared for us to do together and not by ourselves. God has never called us to do this by ourselves, but with one another. And I was actually kind of thinking about it a little bit. Um, I like do like this analogy, and I also like don't like this analogy for a lot of reasons, but I'm going to use it anyways, of kind of like a savings account, right? Like you go and you make withdrawals, but eventually if you don't ever contribute anything into it, you're not going to get anything out of it anymore. And you'll just be like, oh, well, that, I'm just going to go find a new checking account. Not that that's how it works, but like that's, that's usually what happens. I go to a church and I go, all right, what does this have for me? What does this have for me? And I take and I take and I take. And if we aren't careful, we'll just do that. And we won't put, in our, any, we won't put ourselves into it either. And eventually we go like, ah, this isn't doing it for me. And I'll try and go find something else flashy or cool or just different enough to shake the dust. But at the end of the day, you realize that what's missing in that body is you. You are what's missing in that body, being a part and contributing and working alongside your brothers and sisters. Paul gives us this purpose, what our gifts are for in verse 13. It says Ephesians 4.13. Until, this right here is really important, we all, not until I reach unity with myself, it's until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of, of God. So our goal is to reach unity in our faith. And that faith is what we believe. The knowledge of Christ. So once again, these are the things that we know and that produce action in us. And so that we can also become mature. And this is what he's talking about. And that's going to be the next section we look at in a second. But it's our goal is to become mature. And God isn't calling Christians to build buildings where he can go and have his presence there, but he's actually calling Christians to build Christians. He's calling Christians to build the church so that it's built up, so that God would manifest himself there in each believer. And like we spoke of last week about being filled with the fullness of God, in the same way, we as the body want to attain looking like who is our head, who is our Lord, who is our Savior, which is Jesus. Ephesians 2, 19 through 20 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Talked about it a while back. That chief cornerstone is what sets the, the direction for the entire building. So we are built, being built up in unity, set by the direction that Christ has set, trying to look more like Christ, be built into the dwelling place for him. So we're going to look, we're going to move into the final section. We looked at our call to unity in the body and in faith. We've looked at the giftedness and the equippedness for God's good works for the building up of his body. In the last section, I titled uh, the next slide, yep, from Playmats to Maturity. This isn't the original title I had. The initial one I had was From Babies to Boomers. Um, but I didn't want to commit to that one. Uh, 
From playmats to maturity. What are playmats for? They're for protecting or the protection. I have a bunch of little kids at home, so we have playmats, and like this is all the squishy area so they don't fall down, bonk their head, do all those things that little kids do when they're exploring. But the reason that we have these play mats, the reason I kind of use this word is, first of all, because both have the word mats in it, and I like that. Uh, but the point is when you are a baby or a child, you're vulnerable. Which leads me to, my fi- to the final section of the verses. Ephesians 4.14 says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of the people in their deceitful scheming. Babies are vulnerable. So if you're not maturing in your faith, your faith stays vulnerable. And it's only a matter of time for it to either be blown away or for you to be deceived and taken away or for you to be distracted or choked out which is what this warning is saying here. He's tossed back and forth by the waves, blown around by the different winds of teaching, because you don't stick to anything. You don't believe anything as a foundational truth. You're like, oh, well, maybe. That, that doesn't cut it when the winds show up. And so the best way that I could think to explain this text is this. It's easy to take candy from a baby but it's really hard to take candy from an adult. Kind of a joke, kind of not, okay? It's, it's both, all right? It's true. There's a reason this is a saying. It's like taking candy from a baby, which is what, he, what is Paul saying? He's saying, don't be a baby because your faith is in danger if that is the possibility. And why? Because it's easy to take candy from a baby. It's easy. But if you're an adult who likes his candy, it's going to be much more difficult to take that candy. I have a lot of young kids at my house, like I said. And as much as I love them, and because I love them, I don't want them to stay kids forever. I want them to grow up. Because in a lot of ways, it's really cute when kids are kids, but it's kind of gross. <laughs> That's me maybe holding back. I don't know. It's a little gross when people continue to grow up but don't grow up, right? When you have people who are adults but act childish. Because here's the deal. All of us are getting older, but not all of us are maturing, right? All of us get older, but not all of us are actually maturing, growing in that sense. And that's not what Paul wants for us. That's not what he wants for the Ephesians church. That's not what he wants for any believer. And we don't want that. We don't want to be a church full of spiritual immaturity. So we should want to grow up. And it's a positive thing, just in case you didn't know that. It's a positive thing. Smile, right? So we need to grow and become mature as believers. It's not an option. And maturity isn't just what we believe and know, but what we do in light of what we know. It's how we act. Because we know these things. You can know stuff, but that's, that's kind of the worst part. That's the biggest immaturity. So there's some sense of immaturity where it's like, I, don't, I didn't know any better. But then it's really immature to know better and still not, like, do better, right? So maturity isn't just what we believe and know, but it's what we do in light of what we know and what we believe. And it goes on. Um, I should probably call up the band. I didn't put up a thing in my notes, so I'll call them now. Ephesians 4, 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. So speaking the truth, because we know the truth. We can speak the truth when we know the truth. And we do so in love, right? It doesn't just say, speak the truth. Because all of a sudden, everyone doesn't like you anymore. If you just speak the truth, I'm just speaking the truth, man. I'm just doing that. I'm just speaking the truth. You will not have any more friends. You won't have any more people around you. Um, Which is, it says, in love, right? That's that intentional love. So when we speak the truth, we're intentional to do so 
in love, right? In love and with love for those that we're speaking to because we want to we wanna grow. And speaking truth in love and out of love to our church members and our families and our friends, um, when we see them not walking in accordance to, hey, we believe this, and I see you not walking in the same manner. Or, hey, I saw you believe this, but this is how you're living. What's up with that? How, when we can approach that to speak with love and in love, that's a mature thing, which is why it doesn't always go well, right? It, we do this because we love them. But although it may not be received well at first, that's actually the reason that we need to grow in maturity. Because sometimes we can't hear that we need to change our ways. Sometimes we can't hear, hey, this is what you believe. You're not living like it. And that's like, that's a grown up uh, like conversation to have. That's an adult conversation to be able to have to say, hey, you believe these things. You're not walking in accordance with it. And if you can't take, well, one of the biggest signs of immaturity is not being able to take instruction or guidance especially from those who want the best for you, which that's our goal. Remember, that's what we're, we want the best. It's an intentional love, intentionality. Proverbs 15, 23 gives us a couple. Uh, we're going to see two different places in uh, Proverbs that give us s- snippets of that. And uh, those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. The next one we can move on. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you right? So that's just kind of like a a little bit of a test of like, hey, how do I receive instruction? How do I receive instruction? Do I get mad at them immediately? Here's the deal. I do. I sometimes, people are like, hey, this is what's up. Here's what's going on. I'm like, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm just going to be second, you know, and you get enough time, you know, and God's like, calm down. And then I'm like, okay. And I can, we start to have those conversations. Um, it's because I'm still growing in maturity. I, I, need, I want to be more mature. And most of the times that I've gotten mad, people were like, what do you, oh, that's how you took that. Because I literally, I care about you. Or I had something better for you. I just want to make sure things were good, you know. So a growing church is a maturing church. And, and growing in the true sense of like, not just numbers, but in our and our maturity of who we are. And me and Greg were actually, Pastor Greg, we're talking about it this last week about, I mean, he constantly says healthy things grow, which is true, which is true. Um, but we were thinking of a different way that we could refine that of healthy things mature. It's kind of what we had landed on, this idea of healthy things maturing. Like that's really what we want. We don't want just growth for growth's sake, but we want actually maturity in that. Ephesians 4.16 From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. All of this is from Jesus and Jesus is building his church and he has set us on mission with himself to build his church here and now. And And that's not just a building, but that's actually the believers. And this is not something that you or I can do apart from the body, but it's something that God has designed for it to be done within and among and alongside the body by his strength and power. Romans 12, 1 through 8 kind of paints this picture, this picture from what we believe to what that looks like. And it kind of it echoes Ephesians. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as Each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. 
If it is to encourage, then encourage. If it is giving, then give. Generous, generous. Oh my gosh. Generous. I can't say it. Yeah. That. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Is that the end? Yep. In view of God's mercy, this is how you can live. This is how you're to not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but considering those above yourself, serving them, living with them. So as part of the body, we each do our work using our gifts that Jesus has given us, striving for unity and being equipped and equipping so that we can mature as a body together. And we each do our part, our work together. And this is the groundwork for the life, a worthy life, a life worthy of the calling of which we have received. That when we put our faith in Jesus, that we've had a call to not look like how the world looks, but to look completely different. So, Today, if you have been sitting on the sidelines of the body, then I urge you to not do that any longer. Don't waste another Sunday or another day of your life by not using your gifts that God has given you. And he hasn't given them for you. He's given them to benefit the body. So if you are keeping them to yourself, then they, they're no use to you. They're not even your gifts. They're for his body. And you feel like you don't know where God wants you or how God wants you or maybe why God wants you, well, then there's people here to equip you. That's what the pastors, the shepherds, the evangelists, God's word is for. It's to help us figure out where do we fit in this. God's made us each distinctly. We can't, it wouldn't be right. It would be wrong to say, I don't need you to other parts of the body that God has gifted you in. So we're here for you if you don't know where. If you do know where, you just haven't doing it, then just do it. And that just kind of solves that, right? Remember, all of this isn't for your salvation. It's out of, okay, God saved me. Now what? Now what? What are we supposed to do? He's given us how we can live with one another. And if you don't know Jesus, and you may be hearing about all the things about how we live and how to live, you got to know that the Christian life is a different life, radically different because our Savior has radically saved us. He's changed us and given us a new life, which looks different than anything on the planet. And so first and foremost, this was made possible by Christ and his ministry, his obedience that he provided, that he would die on the cross for our sins, taking our punishment, raise again, defeat, having shown that he defeated death. Death couldn't hold him. And he ascended on high with all authority in which we are commissioned and put on mission by him. And in scripture, Jesus tells us, Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. You may be thinking, how can you talk about rest when you just talked about doing good works or doing things? 1 John 5, 1 through 4. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is the love God, or this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's a different life. The Christian life is a different life, and Christ is the only way, and there's only forgiveness in Him and peace found in Him, even in all this new life that we're called to. So I hope that you'll hear this call that you'll hear this response or that you'll have a response in your heart on either side of whether you're a believer who hasn't been a part of a body actively or if you've never been a part and you feel God pulling you and drawing you and calling you, respond. Would you guys please stand?
We're going to enter into a time of response. We're going to have the elders on the side. Um, Paul and Kathy, if you guys would be over there, I'll be over here. Um, and we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you for anything that you have going on in your life. We want to pray for you um, for any needs, anyone that you know that needs prayer. We want to pray with you because we also want to be a praying church. It's powerful, not because we're powerful, but because the one that we pray to is powerful. And so please come pray with us. We want to pray with you and for you. And we have the Connect card here, and this is just either a way to get to know you, as we talked about being known. Don't be invisible any longer. We want to know you, so this is a way. I will call you this week if you, if you check this box. I'm the guy who calls people when it comes to this. And I enjoy getting to have those conversations and just be able to make an initial connection because we don't want you to feel invisible either. We don't want you to be invisible and we don't want you to feel invisible. So we want to be intentional to get to know you, love you, get you connected, and start to equip you and build you together and knit you together as the body. Or if you have questions, that is another opportunity. We talked about the belonging or becoming a part of the body. Um, next week, we have membership class where we lay out all of what we believe fundamentally, um, all of who we are and what our mission is and what we're doing as a body and how to be a part of that. Um, and so if you haven't gone to that, you should. You don't have to become a member just because you went, but you definitely will get lots of information and it's the best opportunity to ask any questions that you would have about our beliefs, about our mission. So that's it. Let's pray um, and then we'll worship. Father God, we give you this time. We love you and we are so thankful for your mercy and your grace that you have shown in your son, Christ Jesus, by taking our sin making us new as we've put our faith in you and believe and trust that you will radically change our life. Lord God, we trust you. We thank you for your word. Lord God, we live to be conformed by it and understand it and to trust you and know you better through it, Lord God. So Father, we ask that you would bless this church, bless us and continue to build us up, not just adding numbers of people, Lord God, but also adding in our maturity and in our growth one another, uh, with one another and to one another, encouraging one another. Please help us. Please help us. We need you. We want you. We long for your grace to be poured out on us, Lord God, that you would make yourself manifest by the gifts that you've given your church. Lord God, that we'd use them and not be slothful in our, in our giftings, Lord God, for your body. Help us be able to be built up to look more like you, that we'd shine brighter in this community, brighter towards one another, Lord God, and be encouraged at the great work that you do within us. So we thank you. We love you. We give you all of this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.